Good morning, guys. So the plan for today is to talk about a second way of dealing with dynamic models and bridging them to statistical models. And after this, this lecture, after the break, what we're going to do, we're going to have a session of Q&A because it's going to be our last class, unfortunately. We are going to discuss and like you guys can ask questions about or doubts that you have about the whole course. So we'll do like a conversation session and you can ask about topics that we, we saw, topics that we didn't see, anything that you guys want. So now for our class for today, I'm going to show a different a slightly different way of dealing with dynamic models than what Geogo showed. And hopefully it, you will get excited and it will make sense. And what I'm going to show is based on ecological experiments. And ecological experiments, they have had a central role in building both ecological thinking and theory. And this comes back to the work of Gauss when he did the experiments showing the competitive exclusion principle. So you probably saw this in Roberto's class and in, yeah. And so basically what Gauss did was he grew species of uh, protozoan by itself, which is the, the continuous line. And then he grew them together, showing that they couldn't coexist happily when grown together. Another classical example in ecology was this work done by Van der Meer. And what he did was he wanted to fit parameters of the logistic equation, which is also another type of dynamical models that you have seen in Roberto's class. And he did that for four different ciliates. So basically he grew them separately and then he grew them together in pairs and he grew them in in like the full combination. He was interested in seeing whether there was any kind of higher order interactions in the system. And then he fit these different parameters of the logistic equation based on looking at time series data. And what I think it's interesting is, I'm going to uh, mention a quote by Richard Levins from 1968 where he said that the word theoretical used to have a pejorative connotation in ecology. And this came because people thought that the right to theorize was a reward for years and years of field and laboratory experiments. And I like this quote because this, this, what this means is that you actually need to know your system to make, like, to be able to theorize about it. But I'm also happy that it doesn't have a pejorative meaning anymore <laughs> because that's what I work with. <laughs> So I, I like to bring back the idea that we need to know about our study systems. But all this, the studies, they were done considering only two species or just a handful of species. But we know that ecological communities are very diverse. So to really understand these ecological communities, we need to go big and study large systems with many species. And it's not straightforward to go from two species to n species. And one of the classical examples in ecology is the Cedar Creek long-term research experiment. This is one of the oldest experimental settings that's still running in ecology. One of the uh, main researchers working with this is David Tillman. And what they have is like they have basically uh, a lot of different plots where they grow species of plants and they're interested in many questions regarding uh, cycling of nutrients, coexistence, biodiversity, and how it's related to ecosystem functioning. And so when we're performing these large experiments, this allows us to answer questions like, for instance, this relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, which is basically what people do is they grow different species together and they ask, is a more diverse system, does it have uh, better functioning. And then when they're talking about functioning, they're usually measuring some sort of like biomass for the system or respiration. So they, pl they put plots of like just one species together, they grow them in monoculture, and then they measure biomass for the system. And then they do two species together, three species together, and so on, and measure this biomass. And what they, mainly what they want to do is build some sort of like relationship between your ecosystem functioning, which can be, for instance, biomass. 
And then here you have species richness. And then what you would have is like here you have your monocultures. So they have like some sort of biomass. Then you have your two species. They grow to a certain biomass, three, four, something like that. And then what we usually see in this kind of data is like they try to fit some sort of model to understand this relationship. And it's like usually a saturating relationship. Another type of uh, questions that we can answer with this large experiments is the assembly of communities. So is there a predictable sequence of species that we would expect in a system when you're interested in restoration ecology, for example? You want to know how communities assemble over time. And when you're interested in restoration, am I going to recover the ecosystem functioning or the processes that I was interested in when you're doing restoration? These large experiments also allow us to understand the role of determinisms and stochasticity in ecological communities, which is related to the assembly of communities as well. But working with these large ecosystems also comes with a lot of challenges. And one of the challenges is that the, the possible number of combinations that you can have from a pool of species is very, very, very large. So if you have a pool of species, let's say you're running this experiment where, where you're interested in species richness and ecosystem functioning, where you, when you have a pool of 10 species, you have two to the n minus one possible combinations of different species that you can put together, only considering I, I grew like all of them by themselves. I grew A and B together. I grew A and C. So you have this enormous amount of possible combinations. And it's a very challenging for researchers to understand what are the combinations that I need to perform in order to get a better understanding of how the system works. Another challenge that we have is that Rarely all these different assemblages or communities will coexist together. So again, if you have this pool of 10 species, you're not guaranteed that all the 10 to the 23, no, sorry, 100, 1,023 communities, you don't know if all of them are going to coexist. So some of them, you might put a triplet, three species in there, and they collapse to a two species community. So coexistence in the systems is also challenging because you're not guaranteed to have coexistence. And you need to be able to learn how to deal with this, with the, with your system if you have this case where triplets becomes co-cultures, where you, when you have this kind of collapse. So how do we navigate this large space of possible assemblages? So our goal here today is to develop a method in which we can take a limited number of observations from this whole community, from a pool of diverse communities, and we want to make inferences about larger communities. And more specifically, what we want to do is we want to predict whether or not species are going to coexist based on a limited number of experiments. And if they do ex uh, coexist, can we predict their abundances? And so this uh, approach that we're going to develop, develop today. This was done by a work done by uh, Dan Maynard, which was a former postdoc in Stefano's lab. So this, is, uh, this was the initial uh, approach. And then we, expand, we explored this approach in a paper that came out last year. So what we're going to do is develop this approach that uses this like, limited number of experiments and where species composition is manipulated, kind of like what we have with uh, BEF, Biodiversity Ecosystem Functioning Experiments. And then from this, we want to predict outcomes of experiments that we haven't performed yet. So to explain what's happening in the system, so basically what we have is you start from a pool of N species and then a researcher goes and, and conducts these experiments where they grow species 
together or by themselves. So here would be an example of like this green species growing and then the different lines are different replicates of the same community. So these communities, they can go to different places. So you take, you grow them in like this time series, then here you grow the orange species by itself, here you're growing the purple and the green one. They all reach some sort of state and then you take this states and you call them endpoints of this dynamics. So at some point you, you have a reason to assume that if species were gonna go extinct, they went extinct and they don't necessarily have to reach a stable point. You can see that in here, some of them are still cycling, but they have reached uh, some sort of stable state or some sort of endpoint for this dynamic. And then we collect these endpoints in this matrix that we're going to call matrix X. So here is the results of this first experiment. So you have your replicates here, and then you collect these endpoints in, in this matrix. So basically what we do is we let the dynamics settle. We measure the densities of this coexisting species at what we call endpoint, and we arrange these end, this endpoints in this matrix X. So what I'm gonna do here is kind of like, just have the structure of this matrix here so that we remember what's in the matrix. So basically here, we're gonna have the abundances of your species. So your columns are your species and your rows are your experiments. You can have like, experiment one, replicate one, this is, would be replicate one, you can have replicate here. Experiment two, replicate one, and so on. So this is the structure of the data that we're looking at. So basically, yeah, again, this is just showing what this would look like. So this is kind of the structure of your data. You have your measurement for your first experiment, for your second experiment. In your third experiment, you grew species two and three together. This is kind of like showing what would be here, but without the replicates, this is what our data looks like. So the simplest model that we can do is we can assume that these observations that we have which are like x's, so here I would have like x1, 0, 0, here I could have x1 again, and then here could be 0, x2, so, and this is what we're calling our matrix big X. And so what we can assume is that this value of xi, it comes from a true value plus some error that is associated with the measurements that each, uh, each re researcher are doing when they're like measuring biomass, for instance. And then we can think about how these biomasses are gonna change by starting from like a simple linear additive pairwise model. You guys have seen this, so let's just imagine that the species have been, yes. Um, it's a question a little bit prior to that. Um, uh, how do you experimentally know, that's maybe not actually related to what you were gonna say, but that uh, you already have your stable state? How do you know when you're like getting data, okay, this is the final state and this is the, the ab abundance of species in my setup? So basically what you wanna get to is the idea of like, waiting for this is wait for any transient dynamics in which species will go extinct. So you wanna make sure, the only thing you want is to make sure that species, if they're gonna go extinct in this composition, you wanna make sure they have had enough time to go extinct. If, if, they're, if there's gonna be cycles, you can still deal with cycles. You just don't want any spurious coexistence. So a species that's gonna be there, you hope that it's gonna be there. Okay. So you just wait enough time for that species to go extinct. So if you think about like Goss's experiment, you would want to wait until, like you don't wanna take your measurement here, you wanna take your measurement like here. 
So you're assuming that enough days have passed so that you can see the second species going extinct. But my point is, how do you know that you have waited long enough? I guess you have to know your system. Know your system. Yeah, yeah. And then when you do replicates, you can start your like you can start your experiment with different abundances and see if they go to the same place. This is actually one of the premises of the model. But then when you do that, and you you might get to like this, you might get to this result faster if you start from different abundances. If you do replicates, so yeah, and you expect that your system will always go to the same place if you're doing that. So what we want to do is, is, is um, model the species abundances. And so what we can assume is that they are just a linear relationship of all the other species. So basically what this model is saying that is that so you have the abundance of species I in community K. And then this is given by this baseline abundance. And this baseline abundance is modified by the presence of every other species. And then this is modified by this uh, coefficient and the abundance of the other species in community K. And then you could have like replicates for this. So, so this is the... baseline abundance of I. And then this is for J different than I. And then this is like how much species J modifies the abundance of species I. So it's the influence of J on abundance of I. And yes. Uh, just a question about this formula. Uh, since you have a minus there, are you assuming the effect on the species I will always be negative? No, or this this uh, beta can this beta can be positive or negative. It doesn't matter. No, yes, but since you have a minus before the the epsilon. Uh, if you have a positive, if you have a positive relationship, at sorts won't it turn negative because of that, because of the sign. Yeah, if if the relationship, what you mean, if the effect of J on on I is positive. Yeah, like mutualism. Yeah, then this means if it's a mutualistic relationship, then this coefficient would be negative. The coefficient would be negative. Yeah, because then you have a negative with a negative. And then that becomes a plus. Oh, okay. And then what, what would happen is like if for species two they, they are mutualistic together, that means that this coefficient would be negative, and then this would become a positive sign, and then the abundance of I would grow with the abundance of J. Okay. So this coefficients can assume both values, positive and negative. Just out of curiosity, how is this uh, how would that coefficient be calculated? The be the beta? We're going to get there. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. How are we going to get there? So we can do some rearranging of this equation, which is basically what we can do is let's, let's shift this and put all the x's in one side, because that's usually what we do. So we put all the x's. But let's do it here. So what we do is then we have this. We can have that alpha i is equal to our x i of k minus then what we can do based on this, we can divide everything by by y i, and then with this here becomes a one. And then what we can do is we can bring this x to the sum, 
And then when we do this, this sum is going to be over j and not over j different, sorry, different than i, not over j different than i. So we're just bringing this here. And then what we can have is a sum over j. And then the important thing is that what's in here now is that when we have this bii, this is going to be 1 over the alpha i. And then when we have bij, this is going to be the beta ij over alpha i. So we just did some rearranging of this. And we can also write this in a matrix form for those that are more uh, familiar with that. So basically, when you, have, when you have a sum, this is the same thing of having a matrix uh, multiplied by a vector. So what we're doing here is just considering that B is, a ma is an n by n matrix, and X is a vector of the densities of the species. So our goal is to fit this matrix B and once we have an estimate of this matrix B, basically we have an estimate of how these different species are affecting each other in our experimental setting. And after we, did, after we do this, we can make predictions about other sets of species that we haven't really observed. But the thing is, can we fit this matrix B? So once we fit this matrix B, ultimately what we want to do is predict abundances. So it's this X hat. So that we can, we can compare the predicted abundance to the observed abundances from our data. And so to do that, what we, what we need to do is we solve for B. That's it. So all we want to do when we have this in a matrix form, this is our model. So if we want to solve for x, what we do is we find the inverse of this matrix. And then this is our estimate for x. And then we're assuming that this x comes from a normal distribution. And this is the true value of x. And then you have, uh, you have a, an error structure. And so fitting the model, basically, what, what it amounts to is minimizing the sum of squares of deviations between the observed data and the predicted model, kind of like we, what we have seen in, uh, in our class for like linear models. Okay. Yes? It's not always, that's not, that's not obvious <laughs> at all. It's not always invertible, but what you can do is when it will be in, when you're taking a subset of your experiments, that's when your matrix is not necessarily squared and that's when it's not invertible, when you have replicates. But what you can do is you can take the pseudo inverse and the pseudo inverse is guaranteed to be your best estimate of your matrix B. But it's not obvious that it is invertible. So what we want to do then is to minimize the sum of squares given by the, our predicted value and our observed value, remembering that our predictions come from inverting this matrix B or using the pseudo inverse of this matrix B. So our fitting steps for this is one of the, the steps there are like different ways in which we can do this. And we have done this in different ways in the papers that I mentioned. But in this, uh, what I'm going to show here is like one of the ways that we can do this. And so our goal is to find this matrix B such that our predictions for our abundances is as close as possible to our observed data. And one of the algorithms that we propose is inspired in what's called the expectation maximization algorithm. So basically what we do here is we propose a candidate matrix B. And once we propose this candidate matrix B, we, or you can sample a matrix and then you compute, the, you get the, your expected values of X. Then you do your sum of square, you score this matrix by, take, by seeing what's the sum of squares and you either accept or reject this matrix according to its score. So then you propose another matrix. You kind of mutate this matrix a little bit 
Is it better than what I had before? Is it not? And then once you do that, you, you have like this core of these different matrices until you reach a point where you're minimizing the sum of squares. Okay. And then with this, you're guaranteed to find a matrix B that can fit your data. And then with the, once you do that, you can predict whether your, yeah, you, you predict whether unobserved assemblages will coexist or not, and if so, at what abundances. But to do this, you actually need a lot of data. And so one of the data sets that we have used to fit this, using this approach is a data set from these researchers where they grew different species They grew different species of native plants and non-native plants in a pair kind of setting. And they were interested in testing how this difference in species richness and origin, whether, it, whether it's a native species or a non-native species, would affect the productivity and seedling establishment in the next generation. So they, they had four different species of different families of plants. For each set, they had plants that were either native and non-native, and they grew them in all the combinations. So they grew 14 out of the 15 possible uh, combinations, and they had 10 replicates for each one of them. So they did basically all of the work of like growing all of them together and a lot of replicates. And this kind of data is very hard to find. So this was like, a lot of work and like really good data. And so what we did is the results for this data is the, this is one of the data sets in Dan's paper. So what we're gonna see is a plot where we have the predicted versus observed abundances. And so what this plot is gonna look like is here we're gonna have the observe abundances for all species. Here we're gonna have the predicted abundances. And then we're gonna see how correlated they are, or, which means how good were our model, uh, how good did our model predicted the abundances of the species once we have estimated this matrix of interactions, this, inter, uh, this matrix B. And then the second result is gonna be what we call the predictions for out of fit. And then for these predictions, what we do is we fit the matrix. So they had all these different combinations of species richness. And then what we do is we take one of their experiments out, we fit the matrix B, and then after we fit the matrix, can we use that to predict that experiment that we have removed? So this is the idea of the plots that we're gonna see. And because this data is really awesome, the fit looks really good. So each one of these different diamonds are the different species of plants that they have used. And this is the predicted abundance once we have fitted our, our B matrix. And then here for each one of these, here what this plot means is that here you have, we fit the matrix without this, uh, this native Asteracea and then we use that fitted matrix to predict the values of, of the monocultures. And then this is for every monoculture. So in here, we excluded each one of these monocultures and then use the fitted matrix for each one of them to predict these values. Here, we did that for the pairs. So we fit the whole matrix without information on this pair and then use that fitted matrix to predict the, what happens with this pair of species. And then this is for, like, this was, yes, yes. So these results are basically the results where we found what is the best fitting matrix for this system of four species. So you have this four different species they that are interacting and they're either native or non-native. So for each one of the systems, what we wanna do is 
we want to find this matrix B, which for each one of these case, we would have a four by four matrix. And then, so this is going to be a matrix for the, we have one for the native species and one for the non-native. Once we find this, the, once we find the, the B matrix that minimizes our, so what we want to do is, we want to get the predictions for B and we want to minimize this. And so we use that expectation maximization algorithm to find this matrix B. Once we find this matrix B, what we do is, now that I have this matrix B, I'm gonna get the predicted densities for all species in all of my experiments. So they did the 15 experiments, so they would have something like this with 15 different experiments. For each experiment, they have 10 different replicates. So they have this huge matrix here. And this is what we want to predict using our matrix B that encodes the interactions. So this would be an, the, what this matrix would look like for that system is we have the interaction between the native Asteraceas and then we have the interaction between the Asteracea and Fabacea and then between the Asteracea and Laminacea, between the Asteracea and Poacea. And then, so this is the matrix that we want to estimate. And this is giving the interactions or how each species is influencing the abundance of every other species. So yesterday, Hinato showed us um, how to work with matrix, and he called this a community matrix. Is that an example of a community matrix? So if I'm not mistaken, what Hinato called the community matrix is the Jacobian matrix of a system, right? So you have a generalized lot cavaltera and then that you assume that system is at equilibrium, and then you look, because you have many species interacting, and you take the Jacobian of that system, and you evaluate that at your equilibrium. That's what's called the community matrix, right? So th this is, this could be seen as the community matrix, but we're not, like I said, we expect species to have reached some kind of endpoint, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily an equilibrium point because they can be like oscillating. But a community matrix would have a similar structure as this one, where you have all the interactions between different species. And what they call the community matrix is when it's evaluated at the equilibrium point. Okay, thank you. Is that the full matrix? Mm -hmm. Is that the full matrix for this case? For this case, this is the full matrix, yes. <coughs> and what about those scenarios where there are multiple species, like three and four species simultaneously? So what we're doing in that case is you want to predict the abundance of Asteracea, let's say, when it's in a community with three other species. So what you have is your baseline abundance of Asteracea when it's growing by itself, and then how much is being modified by each one of this. So it's gonna take into account this whole row here. Okay. When you have all species together. When you have your monocultures, you're looking at this part of the matrix. So these are the monocultures. Um, 
so <laughs> I was um, well in, in the beginning of the, of the explanation, uh, I thought we were dealing with a very uh, basic assumption of our uh, of this of this concept because we were using a linear model. But then and uh, now we I, I'm seeing this graph and. I'm seeing like almost perfect fittings of 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 the data with the uh, compared to the um, our, our predictions. So so actually like the basic linear model is actually this good for for this case. For this specific case, yes. <laughs> okay. Which is which is very like it's very surprising that we have this much of a good fit, but this is because. This specific system, this is one of the guys that read the books, so the plants read the books, no. <laughs> so, no, they have a lot of replicates. They did all the experiments that they could do but one. So, it doesn't seem to that be any higher order interactions in this term. When they grow species together, they go to the same place. So, this is like textbook example. Um, but um, the question is, is um I, I, I don't know if I'm missing something, um, but even with this many um, observations, should uh, a, 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 a prediction this good happen with just a linear model? Is it, I don't yes, know. Yes, yes. Because all, actually if you, you're giving me a good idea for the tutorial. <laughs> if you do this with simulated data, you get a perfect fit. So even just assuming the, the linear model, if you simulate all this and you don't put any noise, you can recover the B matrix that you use to simulate your data. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit lost <laughs> with no, everything. No, let's go, let's go. I don't <laughs> want you to be lost, no. Okay, so the beta is the effect of, of a species on another species that's in the matrix. I'm yes. I'm needing a little help to understand this graph here. What is each one of these diamonds on the graph? So these diamonds are the abundance of the different species in different combinations. And how do I know? Like for example, there are a lot of um Fabasi distributions up there in the top of the graph, right? Yes. The, the little orange ones. That basically means that the Fabaceas grow to a higher abundance than any other species. Independent of the combination of the assembly. Yes. So this is not, this is all, this is all the plots together. So this is yes. not considering like just the monocultures, the pairs of species, the triplets. This is all of them together. Where would any of the species grow? So you see that for, for each little diamond, you have a little bit of shadow in here. So this would be like the replicates. Mm -hmm. So this is like, for instance, this could be the mean value of the Lamiacea when it's growing with everybody else. Yeah, so there's no way to identify like the, 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 the experiment of that diamond? No, not from this graph, okay. but okay. we do have the data to plot that graph with like, this is the abundance for each species in different combinations. This is just pulling all of them together and then you see what, what have, like, what are, what is Lamiasa doing when it's growing in triplets? And then here, for instance, what is the Fabacia when it's growing in triplets? Okay. And then, yeah, so this is the observed abundances and then these are the predicted abundance that we get. Once we fit, we find this best fitting matrix B. Okay, so okay, now I have some questions about the matrix. So B is the matrix that we're trying to find. It is a matrix of parameters. Yes, it's just, so, yes. Can you see that this looks like a linear regression like yes. what we did? Yes. yes, and so these are our parameters. Okay. So 
this is the matrix of parameters, and these are all the parameters that we want to find. Yes, in the diagonal, it's the intercepts, right? In the matrix, because yes. it's the baseline. The, it's this, so the di it's one over the intercept. Okay. Because we do this transformation, this would be the intercept for your xi. And then because we, we do this kind of transformation and this change of variables, your diagonal is one over the intercept. Okay. And does this work? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and does this work in a, I, I, I'm not sure, is this still a Bayesian fitting? So because I remember at some point you saying that we input some initial beta or some initial something in the somewhere, and then it, it'll try to find the best parameters. So it works like in the same manner that it'll, it'll re not rearrange, but it'll. Yes, it will converge to a, a distribution with this, ex this EM algorithm. It's going to go and find. So it's Bayesian in the sense okay. that you start with a guess of what your B matrix can be. And then this optimization algorithm, kind of like an MCMC, goes and finds the best fit, the best matrix that gets your predictions as close as possible to your observations. Okay, and finally, yeah, I'm not sure if I have, I, I, I surely have more questions, but I don't know if I can think of about them right now, <laughs> but thank you. Um, so this looks very beautiful, but we have 16 parameters, right? Yes. Could this be considered overfitting somehow? N so I wouldn't say that for this case because of the amount of data that they have. So we're fitting, yes, we're fitting 16 parameters, but we have, so 15 combinations and then 10 replicates for each one of them. So I would say we do have a lot of data and it wouldn't be overfitting in that sense. And so now let's move to this second plot. So we understood this one, yes? So for this one, what we're doing is, so we have this huge amount of data, but now what if I never observed this Asteracea growing by itself. So I only take out the monoculture of the Asteracea. And then I do the same thing and I fit my B matrix. It's gonna be a matrix that it's slightly different than the one that you fit with the full model because you have less data. And then once I find this B matrix, what I can do is, so I found a matrix without considering that I have the monocultures. But then I'm fitting this whole thing, right? Then what I can do is use this part of the matrix to get the predictions of how this species will grow in the presence of the others, by, even by itself. Because you have found the whole thing, the full matrix, what we can do is ask questions about experiments that we haven't done or we haven't seen, even though for this kind of data, we do have the data. So we do that for when, when we're disregarding the, each one of these mono, monocultures. And then what we do is, so this is all the, the, our predicted abundances. And then this would be the center of this line here is, so, the, so all of these are like our observed abundances. And then this little diamond is what, sorry, what we're predicting and then so what we have here is all of, this, all of these predictions look good. The way of seeing is, is the diamond shape, are, are all these little balls inside the diamond or not, the diamond or the violin plot? When it's not, what this means is that this one, which is like this case here, we are predicting a lower abundance of Poasia for just one of our predictions. We're predicting it to be lower than it really is when it's growing with Fabacia. So in, for, okay, let's go through this one slowly again. So what we did for this column here is, 
all of the experiments that we have, the 10 replicates that we have, when Fabasia and Poasia are growing together, we took it out. We don't have this. We're saying like, I never, I never grew the species together. So what we did then, we fit, our, we fit our matrix without considering this particular experiment. Then we went and said, okay, now I have the full matrix. I can predict this experiment. And then you go and you, you do the predictions. And then this is the distribution of the predicted values. And then the true value is the one that's like right in, in the middle. And then what we can see is that this is predicting a lower value than what it really is. So for this guy, for example, but it's, that's just like one. So it's not completely out. Yeah, so the, the little balls are the predictions. Yes. And the, the violin plot is the observed? The violin, it's, yeah, it's the whole distribution. No, the, the, obser the observe is, pff, if I'm not the, not. the little line in the middle. Yeah, the line in the middle is your observed. And then okay. this violin plot is just the distribution. holding your whole distribution. And then it gets <laughs> like, it gets fatter when you have more points in there. Yes. No, yes, yes. And then the, so like the, 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 this prediction also calculates 10 replicates for each experiment because there are multiple little balls inside the violin. Yes, no, it's not, no. You get, no, you get one prediction for each combination. I need to think about that, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll think about that. Then just to see if I understood it properly, uh, the shape of the diamond is like the distribution of the absurd values yes. in the experiment. Yes. So mm, I'm not sure if I'm thinking this correctly. It's probably mm -hmm. wrong, but the, the size of the diamond would be related to standard deviation or a confidence interval. It's the spread of your values. It's a spread, right? Yes. So it's yes. none of them. <laughs> I just want to be sure, thank you. Okay, now, okay, yeah. So each one of these black diamonds is your observe, yes, your observation, the little balls. And then this violin plot is showing the, because like what you said, this is an, a Bayesian inspired approach. So you get a distribution of B values, of, of B matrices. So this is all the possible distribution of the B matrices. Yes. But then the, the, the violin plots are not related to the, to the beta, to the, to the. Yes, they are because the violin plot is defining all the possible values that you can have for your distribution of matrices. Here I'm assuming that we only have one matrix, but yes. because this is a Bayesian approach, you have a distribution yes, of yes, possible yes. matrices. Yes. But then the, 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 the predicted abundance would be the, my predicted value of x. Yes. Yes. And then this is just showing all the all the, the possible, the possible values, values that you can have. For of beta to assume a, that, that predicted abundance of, abundance yes. of x. Yes. Okay. But this, all of this violin plots is when you're not using this data, for example. But then, okay. You're not using, you're not using the monocultures and yes, then you yes, want to yes, predict yes. the monoculture. And then you do separately for each one of the experiments. Yeah, so again, this fit, they look great, but to, foot, to fit this full matrix B, it requires, like you said, fitting N square parameters. And then to do that, we do need 
a lot of data. And this is not always what we find. And now what I want to do before we move on to how can we deal with this huge, yes. So I was trying, I was wondering since the beginning of that slide, how, how would experiment like that be designed in the sense of what I would choose as native and non-native? I don't think it's as relevant to understand the statistics, but I just can't get it out of my mind because like, um, I don't know, maybe some non-native species came from the same place and like they are non-native for Kachinga, but they are both from the same environment from India. Could that happen? Could that have some influence over the experiment? So I guess it depends on the kind of questions that you want to ask. For their case, what they did is they used old field plants from a place in the US and then they have, they knew which one were the native ones and they knew which one were non-native and then they were interested in understanding how this two different set of species, one and they were both growing in what they call the native place. So are they different in their productivity, in their seedling establishment, when you're doing this kind of experiment where they're growing alone, they're growing together, and then you vary the number of species growing together. So in this case, they, they could define very well what's native, what's non-native, and in their question, that made sense to grow them in the native environment. But I guess it depends on the question that you're interested. Yeah, what I'm asking is, um, because it's, in my view, they're also looking at like diversity interactions between them or not? In what sense? In between the species. Because when they grow two of them together, they're trying to look at how these two interact. Yes. Right? And these are, these are actually families, but whatever. Um, and so if I, thinking of that experiment, if I want to know like, Let's say it's Kachinga, and let's say I have two different species from like monsoon forests from India. I don't know. And they are not native to Kachinga, but they are native to the same environment, like, and they would interact maybe? They're na you mean they're, their native environment is a biome similar to Kachinga? Okay, let's say they, I take two species that are not native to Kachinga, they are native to Cerrado. Mm -hmm. And then... But they, you find them in there. But then you find them in the Kachinga and then you're trying to see if, like, it's that experiment. Yes. Okay. And then I'm, I, get, I get my native species, I get my non-native species, but some of these non-native species to Kachinga are native to the same uh, biome. They're yeah. native to Cerrado. Could that interaction interfere with something there? Like from these two plants that are native to the same place, but non-native to my... Um, to my interest biome. Yeah, so, yeah, that you could have an influence in that. And what you can do is look at what do you see in this matrix B that can give you any information about this. So you can use your inferences from this matrix to get an idea of whether or not the, they are structured differently because they come from one biome or the other, or if their interactions are somewhat conserved in terms of families. Do the different families interact in a similar way, regardless if they are from Cerrado or Kachinga? You could 
look at that by looking at the structure of your full mat of your matrix. Is that what you're asking? Kind of. Um, yeah. Just quickly about that BII and BIJ. Is the BIJ equal to BIJ over alpha i? What? <laughs> BIJ equals to BIJ. Ah, beta. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, yeah. That's a, yes, that's yeah. a beta. So now, how can we actually bridge this with a dynamical model, right? After all, this is a dynamical model. Um, class. So let's revisit the generalized log Cavaltera, which I think you did yesterday with Renato. So that's a great reminder. So in a very simple form, we can write this as this differential equation. So x dot is just the same thing as writing the x dt, if you're not familiar with that. So what we're saying here is that the abundance of species i, the way that it changes over time is by, so you have your, the abundance of the species and then it has a certain growth rate and then this growth rate is modified by the way that it's interacting with every other species through the matrix A. And then here again, you can either have the plus or the minus and then you can have the freedom to assume mutualistic or antagonistic interactions by the coefficients, the values in your A matrix. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if this is a minus or a plus, as long as this matrix can assume positive and negative values. So again, let's do some rearrangement of this. And so we just pull, we just like pull this outside or like divide everything by this R I. And then by doing like this kind of rearranging what we get into with this model is this. And I guess this is looking familiar to what we had before. And we can also write this in a matrix form. And then when we write this in a matrix form, what we could have is like this, D of Rx is just a diagonal matrix. So this writing this in a matrix form just means that instead of writing for each one of your I species, you're just putting everything together in this big matrix and you can describe your system by doing that. So this would be a diagonal matrix and this is the Adamar product, which is the element by element kind of matrix mu multiplication. So it's not the traditional multiplication. This is the element wise one. And then what you would have is like this component form when you write it in a matrix form, this is what it looks like. And this looks familiar to what we had before, right? And then so for each, we can have different subset of species like we, like we had before, we can have the full matrix and then for each subset of the species, we can find our predictions by just taking like the invert of this matrix. So this is how we can connect these two things. So this is basically what we had before, but coming from La Cavaltera. So this is how these things are bridged together. But um, what this actually means for this equivalence is that fitting this statistical model is equivalent to finding the equilibrium structure of a log Cavaltera. So because in a log Cavaltera, what you're doing is you're seeing how abundances of species change over time. And then when you assume they reach an equilibrium, you can find the equilibrium of the system. If you do this kind of simplification, you find the equilibrium of the system by doing this, which is basically what we did to find our best fitting matrix. But in this case, you, what, you, what you have is that you want your equilibrium of a lot Cavaltera system to be as close as possible as your observed densities. In other words, we would be fitting this matrix B that has all the equilibria of the system, but this model, when you find this matrix B, this, this generalized log Cavaltera model, it has two to the n possible equilibria, but only one of them is 
positive with all of its components. For only one of them, you have that x, all xi are positive. And this is what we call a feasible coexistence equilibrium because all of the species are coexisting in that system. All of the other equilibrium are boundary equilibrium where one species go extinct or all, or all but one go extinct. And one important note for both uh, of these perspectives is that what we're doing here is like what you asked, Miguel, is when we're fitting this matrix and finding this matrix, what we're finding is this composite parameter. We're not finding the growth rates or the interactions, but it's some version of these parameters because of this transformation that we did. So this is one thing that it's important to keep in mind. And the problem with fitting this full matrix B is that we need a lot of data. And we need a diverse set of experiments. And what are the conditions to be able to fit this full B matrix using the steps that we just did? So what we need is that we need to observe each one of the N species in at least N communities. So that means all of the monocultures at least, right? But also each pair of species, you need them to coexist in at least one community, every single pair. So those are very hard requirements. So that's why it's hard to fit. And then like in here, you see like, you're fitting, the, you're, you're doing all these experiments with only four species and you're fitting 16 parameters. So those are like really hard constraints and it's hard to get this kind of data. It's hard to perform all these experiments. So can we do something more than trying to fit this full matrix? So what we can do is, one of the alternatives is we can try to approximate this B matrix and have a simpler structure of this matrix that reduces the number of parameters that we want to fit. The, so when you say it is necessary to observe each of the N species in at least N communities and each pair of species needs to coexist in at least one community, you're talking about your observed data? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm, that's hard. Yeah. And also, just a little question from, from before. You reached the same equation, like, like exactly the same? Yes. From Alotka Voltaire? Voltaire? Yes. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> <laughs> so you're coming from different places, right? You're coming from a place where you're only thinking about it is statistically saying, I have my abundance of the species. They grow to a certain place. You're not even considering they're changing over time. This is just like, this is the abundance I observe. They have a baseline abundance where they reach when they're themselves and they are modified by this other thing. And then when you think about Lot Cavoltera, they're changing over time. What is their equilibrium abundance? You get to the same place. Okay. <laughs> but it's just that, um, like in the previous slide, you made some assumptions, like from, uh, not assumptions, but like, it seems like. This one? Yes. Or Yes, it seems like because you came from Alatka Volterra, you were able to make a lot more assump a lot more assumptions about everything in your model. Yeah. But you could have done it before also, right? What do you mean? I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> no, because it felt like uh, some things made a lot more sense when you came from the Alatka Volterra. Like, in, in relation to your system, you know, mm -hmm. like when a species coexist and one of them goes extinct. Yeah, um, sorry, I just wanted to say to that, uh, yeah, I also felt that because I was questioning how uh, the model, the linear model made so much sense, but when you said that this was the fixed points for the logic of Volterra model, then it all just clicked so fast. Yeah, but the thing is that the way, the way that we present this as coming from a statistical perspective is that this kind of approach can hold even if you believe that your system doesn't follow a lot of Volterra. It's just that it has this neat connection to a lot of Volterra system, but this doesn't have to necessarily be the case. And in Dan's paper, what they did was actually they 
the uh, simulated data from Lot Cabotera and show the correspondence, but they also simulated data with models that clearly weren't Lot Cabotera, and they used the same approach to fit the data, and it still works. So it's not only for systems that follow Lot Cabotera, but it's, it's cool that there's like this neat connection to it. So it's really hard to fit the full matrix. So how can we approximate this matrix B? So one thing that we can think about is that species, they are sharing different resource, resources. And we can assume that each species have its own private resources. And then there's, other res there's also a, another shared resource by all other species in your community. And this kind of assumptions of different resources, this is gonna lead to a series of models in which we can reduce the number of parameters more and more. And this means that we can fit data that are not as good as the native and non-native, the Kuibin data set. But this also means that our fit is not gonna be as pretty as before, but we can still have we can still learn about these different systems. So one way that we can approximate this is by considering the matrix B to be constructed in this way. So basically what you would have, this D again is a diagonal matrix. So what you have is you have this diagonal matrix this is the part that says D of D. Here you have your species. Let's assume you have the, those four species. And then each one of them has their own private resources, which will be given by this. And then this is modified by this two other, this, this other VW transpose. This just means that you have two vectors, each one of them are representing uh, the shared resources, and this is gonna become this other square matrix, and then you're just summing them. And so each one, what this means, the interpretation of this model is that each species, they interact with their own co-specifics by this diagonal matrix, and then they influence each other through this shared resources and then the interpretation of this shared resources is that so what you have is you have your W would be what we call some attack rate and then your V is your transformation rate which I think that also is something that you guys have thought about either in Roberto's class or in your own different projects, how species are using these resources. So, and each species is characterized by its own attack rate and its own transformation rate. So with this, we have a model that's fitting three and minus one parameters. And this minus one comes because when you're building this this VW transpose, the last component is determined by all the other ones. Does this model make sense? The, the W and the V again? So the W and the V are gonna be vectors that are defining how the species are using available resources. So your W, so you're imagining that all these competing species, they have, each one of them has their own private resource. And then there's an, another resource that they are jointly consuming. And then the V, the V is the transformation rate, how they're transforming that resource. And then the W is the attack rate for each one of this. And how then much they consume the shared resource? Yes. Okay. And then each species is characterized by its private resource. 
and then a combination of transformation rates and attack rates. Yes, and that's the dynamic part of everything. Like that's because when you said you're going to use a dynamic modeling approach, is that you have to use some? Yeah. So this comes. So this this kind of approach is directed related to uh, MacArthur consumer resource approach. And then you can always recast that consumer resource model as a lot Cavoltera. And then we fall into this kind of uh, equivalence between the statistical and the dynamical model. And then here what we want to do is, can we find a way to simplify this matrix B instead of having to fit n square parameters, can I simplify and reduce the number of parameters? So the first reduction that we can do is consider this private resources and then some transformation and attack rate kind of um, parameters. And then this will lead, this combination of these three things leads to 3n minus 1 parameters. So now instead of having to fit n square, we have to, w this is what we have to fit. So this is, so this matrix, yeah, so this is all you have to do to build. So your B matrix is going to be when you're selling these two matrices. Why is it minus 1? Because you have this. V and this W, and then when you're multiplying them together to build this other square matrix, your la the last one is, um, the last uh, element is already defined by all the other ones. Okay. That's why. Okay. Yes. In that case, if I had two shared resources, I would have two extra V debut. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can matrices. have yes. You could have another, another matrix here, that would be your like V two W two. And then if I had, I don't know. Let's say, all of them apart from Fabasie. Uh, uses the second resource, I would just have a zero for Fabasia, right? Yes. Okay, just to see if I understood it yes. correctly. So, an, and then another simplification that we can do is that what if all of these transformation rates are the same? For some reason, this, like all, you can either think about one or the other one, but like, it takes a certain metabolism to consume this resource and everybody transform it in a similar way. So when we have that, you only need one, then this W1 becomes a V. So you have basically the same thing. Then each species, they are defined by their attack rates or yeah, the transformation rates are the same. So they are defined by attack rates. And they still have their private resources. And this leads to two n parameters to be fit in this case. Because you have n parameters from the diagonal and n parameters for the transformation rates. Can we make it even simpler? Yes. What if all the attacks and transformation rates are the same? Then we only have to fit n plus one parameters. And that means that what we would have is just a matrix that, so you have your diagonal, and then you have one single parameters. And this single, this just means that this is a matrix with all alphas in there. So then in this case, you only have to fit n plus one parameters with our, all the diagonals and a common attack and transformation rate for everybody. So how does this model do? So this is just to show the different models or the different ways that we can simplify this matrix B, the number of parameters that we're fitting. So before, what we had was this arbitrary B, arbitrary interactions for everybody. So this is fitting n square parameters. And then 
this is what we do when we're simplifying the, the matrix like we did now. So for this kind of uh, simplifications of B, we use a data set from this researchers led, this research led by Julia Gedini, and they were interested in understanding how different ecosystem processes, such as ener energy fluxes, would drive and constrain biodiversity and ecosystem functioning relationship during community development. So they have this time series where they grew different species together, and they did this for phytoplankton species, and the species were again grown in a similar uh, experimental design where they have the monocultures, they have all the species pairs, and they had the five species. So they didn't have the whole data like we had before. They had simpler data, and so they grew 16 combinations out of the possible, well, 31. It's due to the five minus one. So they grew like half of the, all the possible combinations. And they ran these experiments for 10 days, which means that it's roughly 10 generations for the organisms that they had. And what we did to fit this, this different versions of our B matrix is we took the data from the, fifth, the, from the eighth day. So not the last one, not so we, we just allow the, the species to settle in somehow and fit the data from the eighth day. So once again, what we're gonna see is the results for predicted versus uh, observed abundances for these different approximations of this B matrix. So this is what we, what, this is what we have, and it's very different than what the fit that we had before, right? So this, is, so this will be the simplest model where we're only fitting N plus one parameters, so we have the diagonal parameters and then a common interaction parameter for all the species. And then, I didn't put, yeah, the colors. So each one of these little dots, again, it's a different, it is a different species. And then these are the observed densities for the species in all of the, all of the, the 16 experiments. Oh, and, then, and then they had, sorry, just one more thing. For like the monocultures and the, and the co-cultures, they had three, three replicates. And then for the five species communities, they had, I think, five replicates. So looking at these graphs, I come back to the question Tiago did earlier. Um, it seems to me like this is really overfitting. Like we increase the number of parameters and then the, the graph starts to fit the model, so. So you still have enough data, but it's not that you're, yes, you're increasing the number of parameters, but what you can, what we can say that this is not overfitting is not only because we have a lot of data. The fact that we can predict communities that we haven't seen before means that we're not overfitting. So if you remember that plot, so before we had like the predictions and then all the out of fit plots, we can actually predict combinations that we don't include when we're feeding the model. So this is one evidence that suggests strongly that we're not overfitting because we can predict things that we haven't done. And this works in the same manner that you remove an observation from the matrix and use the others to predict it. Yes, we okay. can do this for this approach as well. I'm, I don't have the graphs in here, but you can do this for this okay. approach as well. And yes. then, um, like you did all this, not you, the, <laughs> the people from the experiment, they did all this to simplify the model, right? It was to simplify what? Because when you said you're going to simplify the model, I was expecting that it also helped to simplify the experimental design of the, the research, you know? Because it, 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 it requires a lot, of, a lot of replicates and resources and everything. But then you still have the same effort, you know? So... Like, it's the same amount of replicates and... and and combinations of, 
of assemblies, you're just removing parameters? Not for this case, right? Because for this case, they, they had a lot of replicas, which, which is necessary. But also, they didn't grow all the combinations, right? Be when we're, so we developed this model so that, or this method, so that we don't need as much data. Of course, when you do all these experiments, you can learn more about your system. But what this is showing, for example, is that do we actually need all of that experiment to learn about the system? And then if we compare these two plots in here, we were fitting n square parameters, and then in here you're fitting 3n minus 1. Yeah, 3n. So those predictions are very similar. So maybe we don't need all of that information about a given system to be able to make predictions about it. We can make the simplifying assumptions. But again, to showcase the method, of course, we use very good data. Okay, yeah, that's, that's uh, I guess, what I'm trying to get to. Because in the end of the day, like this, this just shows that you can use less parameters and get a, a good fit instead of to, it's n squared or, yes, n squared. For this one is n squared, yes. So then it, basically this shows that like, People who want to research this in the future, you don't have to do as much of an experimental effort. That's so, well, kind of. But one of the things that we can learn from this, to this, this approach in general is what kind of experiments would you like to do, right? So in Dan's paper, they actually talk about this because a lot of this is done well, with some of it with microbial data. And what usually people do is they grow species in monocultures and they grow all the pairs together. And then they want to make inferences about triplets or quadru quadruplets or full communities. So this is one thing that is very common in, in microbial fields. But what we can see from this data from, or from this approach is that the best thing to do there's like some guidelines on how to do like experimental design or implications for experimental design. So instead of doing all your monocultures and all your like pairwise, you have to do something that it's also showing what happens to your full community. So it's not only choose spe every pair of species coexisting, but what it, when you put them together. So for in terms of experimental design, it's better to do like find do all your monocultures, this is and uh, and experiments. But then if you do your full community, that's another experiment, that's one more experiment. Then if you do all the leave one out, so you do if you have five species, you do all the four combinations that you have. You're anchoring the knowledge of your system from the bottom up and from the top down. So this is like a better way of designing the experiments without having to do all the singles, all the, the pairs, all the everything. So we can actually like also use this method to test this. And then we've done some of uh, some suggestions on what are the best designs to fit this kind of model. Yeah, so the bottom line here is actually, yeah, that. So you can, this, this model performs as good as this model for this kind of data. So do we actually need to perform and fit this full matrix B? Maybe not. And there's some challenges and extensions to this approach. One of them is, like I was saying, with microbial data. The problem is that some of the microbial reads, they come as relative abundances. And this kind of approach would not work if we're dealing with relative abundances. And this mainly comes from the fact that, so when you're dealing, when you're dealing with relative abundances, this would basically mean that for this kind of uh, approach, you're basically dividing this by the sum of all x, uh, l that are in k, right? 
and then you get a measure of the relative abundance. So when you're doing this kind of thing and you're not working with absolute abundances, but you're working with relative abundances, when we're finding this matrix B, what can happen is that you can have very different matrices that give you the same prediction. And this is just because you're doing uh, like a relative abundance instead of an absolute abundance. So this is one of the challenges that we're facing right now. Another um, challenge or another cool thing or extension that we can do is we show different ways that we can simplify this matrix B or that we can approximate this matrix B. One of the things that we can do is what if this matrix B contains information about phylogeny? So how species are related to each other. So there's like every, like I was, I was telling Anna the other day that every phylogenetic tree can be described by a variance covariance matrix and then we can use the structure of this matrix as, a, as our matrix B and then we can try to fit parameters that are related to, so when you have this phylogenetic tree, what we can do is we can fit models that are related to the branch length which would give us an information of how the species are competing with each other or sharing resources. So we can include phylogeny in, as uh, one of the ways that B can be modified. And then finally, we can also try to include higher order interactions, which would basically mean that, so coming from this simple model, what you would have is now you have this new set of parameters that just means that species J and L, when they're together, they modify species I somehow. And this makes it like much harder because then what you're trying to fit is a polynomial regression. We don't know a lot about this. So this, this is kind of hard, but doable for the ones with the expertise, which is not me. <laughs> And so when will this method fail? So when we don't have much coexistence between the species, this wouldn't really work. So when we have, um, for instance, when, we, when you're trying, everything that we did here, we're dealing with species that are competing with each other, using resources in a similar way. But when you're doing something like a food chain, you don't really get widespread coexistence between the circle and the, uh, and the triangle. So this wouldn't really work when you don't have widespread coexistence because you can't really fit the interaction between things that are not interacting directly. So we, yeah, this wouldn't really work for those cases. When you have strong multistability, this also wouldn't work. So what does, this means. This basically means that when we were looking at the graphs of different species coexisting, what we had was, okay, so I have this species yellow, and then it was growing for, to this place. And then when it's growing with blue, blue grows, I don't know, to this place. Now let's do a replicate. If you do a replicate, and then what you observe is something like this, and then it's growing with yellow again. This is what we would call multistability. So you have that these two species, they are still coexisting, but they just go to very different places. Even if you start from the same place, if you start from different places, so this method wouldn't work when you have something like that. And this is mainly because the method would try to find something along the middle of this because you're seeing them interacting and then if, if they would reach some of somewhat the mean abundances here, this just wouldn't work and it would give like bad predictions. And finally, when you have really strong higher order interactions, this wouldn't work either because this is just assuming a linear pairwise kind of model. So this would also fail when we move to higher order interactions. And then you can read more about this approach in these two papers. 
And the experimental data comes from these other two papers. And now I think it's time for coffee. And then when we come back, we can talk more about life, <laughs> statistics, <laughs> models. <laughs>